Hi, I'm Morgan and today I'm going to be talking about the best books that I read in 2020. So these aren't in any order, like I didn't do like a top 10 or anything because that would be really hard to narrow down. I read 94 books and I am extremely indecisive. So this is going to be a list of books that I gave five stars to. I don't think it's all the books I gave five stars to, I think I took a couple off, but all of these I gave five stars because I just really enjoyed them for some reason or another. And instead of ranking them, I'm just going to put them into like sections. I just kind of talk about them in little bundles because I'm a fan of organisation. Although they're not in genres because I find genres extremely confusing. So, so first of all, I'm going to talk about series that I read or in a couple of cases, not all of the series, but established series. First of all, obviously, if you've been watching my other videos, I have to start with The Passage by Justin Cronin. The books in the series are The Passage, The Twelve and The City of Mirrors. I read the whole series this year and I absolutely loved them. The books are pretty big and the overall series is kind of a dystopian epic and I found it really interesting that the disease, the thing that caused, you know, the fall of humanity is vampirism because usually if we're doing this kind of downfall of society it's either just like not supernatural and it's like a terrible government or a war or it is supernatural and it's zombies or a disease of some kind but no it's literal vampires. I thought that was quite different and I don't know it just the lore of it really interested me. There were lots of good complex relationships and the overarching plot of just like vampire killing actually kind of made sense and seemed kind of semi-realistic. Obviously it's like supernatural sci-fi type thing so it's not going to be you know actually real because it's not real but it did seem vaguely realistic like the downfall of society the fact that it took so long for these things to happen like it's something like 90 years later actually kind of makes sense because if society completely falls then it is going to take that long an example of the realism that I liked was the soldiers that we meet later on in the series. I think we meet them in like at the end of the first book and then they're in the second book and like it's clear they don't actually know a lot about the vampires, about how they work. They just know what they've learned over the years from experience and yet they're still trying to stop them. They don't know how to stop them but they're trying and that seems very human to me. And as much as I love this, I feel like I should put a warning. It was written in like the 2000, early 2010s type era. And that does come across sometimes. There are a few kind of uncomfortable moments as in reading it in our era. You're like, why did that have to be there? There was like a throwaway line that was quite transphobic that when I read it took me out for a moment. And I was like, we don't need that. Um, and also there is probably gratuitous sexual violence um, that really didn't need to be there. It's not overly graphic and detailed but I didn't really think it had to be included at all. But I wouldn't say that that's something that's pervasive throughout the whole thing. The moments brought me out of the novel um, which suggests that they weren't constant which is nice um, but I feel like I should just warn that there are moments where I was saying oh no this was written a while ago. The next series that I want to talk about is The Darkest Minds by Alexandra Bracken and that includes The Darkest Minds, Never Fade, In the Afterlight and The Darkest Legacy. However this year I only read Never Fade and In the Afterlight completing what is technically like the trilogy. I've also now read The Darkest Legacy but technically I read it in 2021 so it doesn't really count. But even just looking at the two books that I did read In the Afterlight and Never Fade they really solidified this as one of my favourite series. Like I was blown away. <laughs> 
it was a refreshingly original YA dystopia. It did have the typical, like, splitting people into groups, but it actually kind of had a reason for said groups. And, like, a realistic criteria. <coughs> Divergent. <coughs> There's a really great cast of characters in this series, all with uh, differing and contrasting and complex relationships. And just the overall sense of, like, found family, which is... Mwah, I, I love a good found family and this this just did it very well. This series is angsty and action-packed in the typical YA way, uh, but it does it really well and includes a variety of actually capable and complex female characters, which is always a nice addition. And mostly I just love Ruby and her martyr complex. Like, the amount of times I'd be reading and I'd be like, Ruby, why are we doing this? Why? Why are you going down this road? Why won't you just talk to the people around you who love you? But she has a reason for it. There is a reason she acts the way she does. It's not just like some out of character. I am not like other girls. I am independent and I can do things all on my own. It's a lot more focused on the fact that she is traumatised and that has affected her deeply and I just really liked how it was portrayed. And the last one I want to talk about in this section is Record of a Spaceborn Few by Becky Chambers. This is part of the Wayfarers series, I believe it is book three. Um, I did think it was just a trilogy but it turns out there's going to be a book four so that's nice. I'm including this here because it's an established series that I've already started um, but I did only read that one this year, last year. It's 2021 now, last year. I really enjoyed this instalment. I loved how it explored the world further and gave us some great new characters. One of my favourite things about this series is its presentation of humans and how we are not the one all-powerful species, which is what you see in a lot of sci-fi. Instead, we're just chugging along on pure determination. And this book being that it focused on humans showed us a lot more of that and it showed how humanity fits into this world she already created in the first two books. And honestly one of the great things about this series is that the books technically can be read as standalones. You can read them with so much time between them which is great for me because I do that a lot. I forget I'm reading a series and then I go back to it in like a year and I can't remember what any of it's about. But because of the way this is written, because each book introduces new characters in a new location and they are linked, there's links between them all, but you don't need to know what's happening in the other ones and you also don't need to read them in the order that they're written. For example, you could read the second book and then read the first book as a prequel to figure out how it came to, ha came to be that the second book even existed. And then the third book is technically a kind of offshoot of the end of the first book. So, you know, <laughs> they're all related and they're all connected. But the great thing is you don't need to remember all the things that happened. Although I do recommend reading them all because they're just amazing and they're so well written. Oh, I love them. Although I should add. They are very character focused, character driven. If that's not something you're into, you might find them super slow. But I didn't because I love character and I think they're great. The next section is going to be new series that I've started and intend on continuing. The first one I want to talk about was a gift for my birthday and that is Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. Crichton. I don't actually know how to pronounce his name and I should probably google it. This was a birthday present from my friend Ashley who recommends this book to literally everyone um, and I'm really glad she bought me it because I really loved it. Honestly I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed it. It's just a really fun and interesting sci-fi with a great premise and some surprisingly solid characters. Honestly the best part of Jurassic Park was just how much I enjoyed myself while reading it. Truly gave me so much serotonin. Well needed. 
in a year like 2020. I know there's a second book. I don't know if it's a big series or not, but I really want to read the second one. So that's why it's in here. Here? This section. So that's why it's in this section. And then we're going to do a complete genre switch. And instead, we're going to go to a YA thriller, which is A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. This honestly was one of my biggest surprises of the year, like in a positive way. I have bad surprises, which will be talked about in another video. But this was a really good surprise. <laughs> this was also a gift this time from my dad. And I wasn't really sure how I would feel about it going into it. It's not a book that I'd ever really considered buying for myself, but I fucking devoured it. I devoured it. The mystery was so good, so intriguing, and so well written for a YA thriller. Like, unless you can't stand YA or thrillers, I would recommend this to everyone. Like, Unless it's one of those things is something you never read and you don't like, I think you'll enjoy it because I think there's something for everyone to enjoy. It's not too heavy and it's written well and it does remember that it has a teenage protagonist, which is something that I really look for when I'm reading YA. Don't forget that your protagonist is a literal 16 year old or in this case she's like, I think she's like 17 possibly 18. I don't think she's turned 18 yet, but she's like in her final year of school. And teenagers are still teenagers. They're going to do teenage things. And our protagonist Pip is allowed to act like a teenager. I have absolutely no idea how she's going to write a sequel to this. I don't know how she's going to structure it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm excited to read it. I'm kind of excited to see where it goes. And I think it is already out, so I'll read it eventually. My next kind of section is going to be standalones of various genres. The first standalone that absolutely blew me out of the water in 2020 was Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. This was yet another gift. So many book gifts last year, it was great. And this is a new adult romance that is technically kind of alternate history, which I will never not find hilarious. And the romance is gay enemies slash rivals to lovers, which just that in and of itself sounds amazing. But the main characters are the son of the US president and a literal Prince of England. So that just like levels it up. It's also just hilarious and really well written and to be honest, if you're on booktube, you've probably already heard people rave about this. So if you haven't read it, I would recommend. I was one of those people who wasn't sure about it and I absolutely loved it. Shout out to CJ for getting me on it. It was, oh, so good. So good. Next is a book that I am very glad I am not holding up because it's absolutely massive. And that is The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. Turns out, I actually like high fantasy. Who'd have known? This is fantasy with dragons that centres on great female characters who are both physically and politically powerful. It's also gay. I'm not going to get onto the plot because, like I said, it's absolutely massive. But I actually really enjoyed the political and the fantastical elements, even though I've never really been into high fantasy. It's never really, like, drawn me in. There was also a lot of great platonic relationships between both main and side characters, which holds just as much, if not more, weight than the romantic relationships. It's overall just a really great book. I probably won't reread it anytime soon because it's huge, but I would recommend it. The next book I want to talk about is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. This is another really well-written YA novel. Chances are you've read it or seen the movie and if not you've probably heard of it and in my opinion this is one of the rare occasions that a book actually lives up to its hype. Star is a really well-written teenage character which as we've established is one of my favourite things and Angie Thomas tells this heartbreaking story of police brutality and institutionalised racism in the US in a way that is simple while still combats complex ideas. 
this is the kind of book that you can absolutely devour it's such an easy read but it still leaves you with a lasting effect if you're stupid like me and you don't like reading things when there is hype about them i would recommend that you pick this up because it is definitely worth it and my last standalone is a horror i think it's really the only horror that stood out to me at all last year and that is Nosferatu by Joe Hill. I don't, I still don't really know how you're supposed to pronounce it. Like, I know what it says, but how am I supposed to say it out loud? I don't know. I, I'm saying it the way I'm saying it. I, I just, I love this. I know I'm saying that about all of these books, but that's the whole point of this video. These are all the books that I loved and this was one of them. Something that I specifically loved was The Magic System and how it stayed mysterious while still having solid recognisable rules because I think that can be really hard to do. Our protagonist main character Vic is extremely complex and even when she's showing her flaws she still elicits sympathy and we still support her as our protagonist which unfortunately is not always a thing that happens in books sometimes we just kind of ignore the flaws but we don't here we see Vic's flaws we see her for who she is but we know that she is fundamentally a good person and we're still rooting for her against Charlie Manx I also just kind of really enjoyed the general plot and I thought it was super original and it actually made me excited to read because I didn't really know what would happen apart from I knew we were going to Christmas land and I was like I just want to be there get me there I want to know what's going to happen but I didn't know what would happen once we got there and that was really exciting okay my next section is non-fiction I say section I only have one book to talk about but still a section I did read more non-fiction than I usually do last year uh, mostly because I was doing my dissertation but unfortunately that doesn't mean I have a bunch of favorites still only one book and the one I want to talk about that I thought was just really a solid book overall was How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Again, I'm not entirely sure if that's correct, but I'm sorry. I just loved it. What I enjoyed the most about this is that it really hit the right balance of facts and personal story that I enjoy in a non-fiction book. Along with the books that I read for my dissertation, which were mostly academic, I also read a bunch of really great books about anti-racism and kind of anti-xenophobia, thanks to the many lists put together, mostly by amazing black activists. But I would say that this one is probably my favourite. It is quite US-centric, which is understandable because it's written by an American. But it still deals with many broad ideas that are applicable to every country and it didn't do it in a way that kind of alienated a reader who isn't American so I don't think that would take anything away from how it was written because it really was just well written and well structured and I would definitely recommend it. The last section is kind of a smooshed section I just put them together because they're both short and that is poetry and short stories. So firstly I want to talk about the one short story I have to talk about. I read a few of them last year, um, you know a bunch of like the Hugo nominees and this is the one that stood out. It won its category and I understand why and the short story is As the Last I May Know by S.L. Huang. Again I'm not sure if that's correctly pronounced but the name will be here. It's, it's just, it's so good. It was one of the larger short stories on the list that I read, which I think made the most of the room that it had to develop to a certain point that allowed the story to be like, I'm not going to say perfect, because then, oh, it's a perfect story, there's nothing wrong with it. But I think it developed to the point it needed to develop. And it made use of all the space it had. Our young main character is great. <laughs> I loved her um, and I think that it gets the amount of world building right because that can be a hit or a miss in a short story. There's enough included to help us understand the situation but also enough left out to keep us wondering about certain parts of the history and also to not overload the story with the exposition. And the little haiku that 
forms the, the title of the story will haunt me forever. It, it lives rent free in my head. Like, even if you're not going to read the, the story, I, the haiku is just... I'm literally, I'm like slumped here thinking about the haiku. It's just so good. Now I just want to talk about some poetry and then we're done. Of course I'm going to talk about poetry, it's me we're talking about here. The first one I want to talk about is actually the first poetry book that I read last year and it was Life of the Party by Olivia Gatwood. I've been a fan of hers for a while now. I first kind of got into her poetry seeing her perform on Button Poetry here on YouTube and as a poet I just really like how she uses imagery and creates the feelings that she wants you to feel and understand. In this collection I was really interested in how she used true crime and how she showed that it was threaded throughout her life by threading it through her poetry. As a true crime loving poet myself I just really really enjoyed it um, and I would recommend. Especially especially she does one about Eileen Warnos and I really like that. Is it one or is it several? I can't remember. It's been a while since I read it but the stuff she wrote about Eileen Warnos I did really enjoy. And the last book of 2020 that I want to talk about is I Would Leave Me If I Could by Halsey. I talked about this a couple of wrap-ups ago. I think I read it in November. I just I love this. I love her. I love how she writes and I was so excited to see her writing in a more poetic sense, if that makes sense. Like lyrics are still poetry but in a different way. So I was excited to read her poetry. Most of these were written to be poetry and I think that kind of shows through the way she writes and I just, I just love them. I don't really have a lot to say. I love how Halsey writes. If you like any of her songs, I would definitely recommend picking up her collection. Now I just have to go back through the collection and figure out what my favourites are because I just, I just swallowed the book whole and now I can't remember. And those were my favourite books of 2020. Did you guys read any of these books? Do you have opinions? Did you think they were really good or do you extremely disagree with me and think that I am very wrong? If you do, please tell me because I would love to know. If you've made it to the end, I'd love if you could like, comment, subscribe. You can come chat to me in the comments. You can come chat to me in my social medias, which will be linked in the description down below. As always, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.